little or no change in a lot of traditional behavior. Yes, he says, and he talks, he has this whole thing in which he describes what compared equilibrium over time would look, which is actually what von Neumann eventually proves. Okay? The, the motivation, uh, no, nobody ever will ever convince me that the motivation for von Neumann doing that was certainly the mathematical colloquium they created, Val, Vienna, and so on, but was also this description that Schubert gave. If you're always producing the same goods in the same way, consuming the same goods, eventually, that economy is going to reach a stationary state in the, you know, life is going to become repetitive. Short of external shocks, war, cataclysm, immigration, God knows what, right? Bad nature, uh, nature or atmospheric phenomena playing against you, relative prices are going to become constant. That's a stationary state. And in that economy, you may actually grow. In the same way that when you inflate a balloon at a constant rate everywhere, right, the shape of the balloon and the images of the balloon remain the same, they just inflate. And Schumacher says, this may be growth. We may have growth like that. It would be due purely to saving and accumulation. But it's clear to us, to me, he says, that if I look at a historical record, that growth would be very, very slow, extremely slow. And probably, you know, uh, brought uh, uh, open to disruption of demographic type, you know, the Malthusian. Because by purely accumulating always with the same technology, you're not going to grow a lot. And in fact, I mean, we have you know, centuries of that. And if you think of how, how, why Russia or similar system collapsed, it's because of that, right? Which is that they did. They tried to grow at a stationary state, right? Always the same thing, only bigger, only bigger, only bigger, eventually becomes inefficient. Some of the factors, that's the other thing, right? Notice that growth in the von Neumann mode is possible if and only if all essential factors can be reproducible. So if all factors can be reproduced at the same rate, then you're gonna distribute inputs in such a way that you make them grow in a balance that you always have the same. But it's obvious, if one think a moment, that while it's beautiful to have a theory of that, it's because it points to something that in reality is never true. That is, not all factors can be reproduced. And in particular, not all factors can be reproduced at the same speed. And let me tell you, we, one factor that cannot be reproduced at the same speed. Brain, smart people, creative people. You can call it human capital if you want, right? <laughs> Those guys don't grow as fast as you grow factories, right? Or you grow demand for uh, entrepreneurial capacity or high level human capital, high skills. Look at China, look at all the countries that have grown fast. What is it they're hitting? They're hitting one limit. They don't have good human capital. Human capital takes very long to build and it's scarce. It takes intelligent people to be taught by other intelligent people for 20 years to become good physicists, good engineers. You can make a car in three months, in two months, in a month. You can make a, you can make an iPhone in a day. You cannot make a good uh, uh, high energy physicist in, in a day, right? So eventually, some factors become really scarce, which is, in my opinion, what motivates technological progress: scarcity or something. Right? Of course, we're doing today, but this is another topic. What we're doing today is desperately find ways of replacing brains that are becoming scarce and ability that are becoming scarce with artificial intelligence because it's the scarce factor. It's becoming this abundant cheap labor, but it's good for nothing. It doesn't produce growth. It's easy to substitute. It means that smart brains are, are rare and, and expensive. And that's actually what von Neumann teaches, right? At a counterfactual. You gotta use theory sometimes as a counterfactual. There's nothing wrong in studying ideal situation as long as you're smart enough to remember that what you're actually doing is studying an ideal situation, knowing that something that you're assuming there is violated in reality. And it's that violation that matters to understand reality. So that's what von Neumann does. Von Neumann shows you what the general economic equilibrium over time would look like in a perfectly stationary economy, no innovation whatsoever, as long as all factors of production can be reproduced. Okay, that's, that's what you want to understand. That's what you want to capture and, and, and bring with you. And you can write it in a formulation of CS because that's what the CS shows. 
go back to what we did. What is that we learned by writing that thing? You know, A, K at the row plus B, L at the row, one of the row. Right, for those parameter values that you have to discover for which this becomes like that. We discover that if the reproducible factor, this is the reproducible factor, and this is the non-reproducible, right? So the only way output grows is because this grows. Because this cannot grow, it's fixed. <coughs> if I, I can normalize in my example before, I wrote it like that, right? I normalize it to one. So this is the only thing that grows. Wait, but didn't we write that this is constant return to scale? And both factors are needed. So what's going on? Can you imagine what's happening here? You see the question? We need what? Technology. We need no, there's no technological change. Technological change here is fixed. So L is here, this is L. And this is K in that economy, right? And how much L do I have? It's fixed. It's Let me start here. I'm going to use one. Okay? So that's all the L I have. Right? And I start, I have some isoquant. I'm going to cheat a bit. What's going on? How, how does growth take place in this economy? I'm cheating because I. You know, you will see that for the row that allows this, the isoquants cannot be so curved. But I could, okay? But it doesn't matter. The thing I get is what happens here. This is an economy when it started as little capital, right? So it's kind of here. Again, capital labor ratio. Okay, come on. Oof. Ah. All right. <clears throat> Very low. L is always fully employed in this kind of economy, so we don't even have. You can change it and make that L grows and gets more employed, but it's just an extra equation, doesn't help. So let's just assume it's fully employed. Doesn't help. Right? So growth means that I go here. And another isoquant. And then I go from here to here. And another isoquant. And you see what happens? As you grow, the capital labor ratio increases. As an output increase, notice that I'm moving up from this size of one to this, to another one, to another one, to another one. These are higher and higher level of outputs, right? That's growth in that model. So what is the growth is doing in that model? You see, it's changing continuously the capital labor ratio and the factor prices. Right? So you're actually moving from one size of one to another. Holding one input fix because you got to the maximum and increasing the other. If you want to tell the full story, you can start from here, right? Where there's no full employment and then grow like that until you reach this and then you go, wow, doesn't matter. That's why I took away that piece. So the story relies on the fact that eventually Capital is a very good substitute for labor. But if I think, so that's actually a good way of thinking for today, but it's better to think, I think, in a more abstract sense. Capital here is the stand-in for those factors of production that are reproducible at the unit of time I'm talking about. And labor is the stand-in for those factors of production that are not reproducible at the unit of time I'm considering. Right? So one has to be very careful at the unit of time. Right? Over millennia or million years, oil and lots of natural resources are reproducible. Over centuries, populations are reproducible. Over decades, humans are reproducible and human capital is reproducible. Right? So one has to be very careful. So this is suggesting that it's a bit of a metaphor. It says, look, Distinguish at the unit of time you're studying between what's reproducible and what's not. In order to have growth, you better have a situation in which 
you replace what's not reproducible quickly with, with what is reproducible quickly. And then you go. And so, in my opinion, my way of always reading this story, this example, was to say, oh, this is a story about technological change, even if there is not technological change in the model. It's saying, you're moving along the eyes of what obviously cannot happen at given technology. Now, the obviously is, is like Schumpeter, it's a, it's, it's a matter of fact statement. I look out at the history of the world and I say, was there a technology, a fixed technology, in which I could keep adding sub, you know, reproducible factors, holding all the other constants, and kept increasing output? No. Whenever I did that, eventually I changed technology. Right? Unless I have a very strange notion of technology. I call technology everything, every technique I use to produce something. Well, then, yes. Okay? So obviously this is a metaphor about technological change. It says technological change is probably, to the extent it makes you grow, is capable, it's a matter of fact of nature being like that, right? It's not that it depends on economics or you or me or the religion or anything. Apparently, some non-reproducible factors, we can replace them quite efficiently with reproducible factors. It's a fact. <laughs> okay? I don't, I, I'm unable to attach any value to it or, or say that it's just or unjust, it's just the way it is. You know? We used to have horses, we replaced them, and horses are actually expensive and slow to reproduce, and we replace them with biker, with, with motorbikes that are a lot easier to reproduce. Right? We used to have, uh, you know, oxen and we replaced them with tractors and stuff like that. Okay? And just the way it is. Okay? We used to have uh, people doing simple calculations and, you know, have you ever seen the accounting department of big companies in the 1930s? Oh, you can see the chips, thousands of them. It was all mechanized like in a computer, right? And people would pass and step. The past, right? They were doing all the, and now we replace it with things like that. Oh, you know that we were lucky. That I mean, doing calculation and systematic computation is something that humans are clearly not very good at doing. And chips and electricity are a lot better. Well, c'est la vie, you know. <laughs> it's not that we have decided that electricity positive negative is. <laughs> you know, it just it exists and we use it. So that's a, that's the way. It is. So going back, so Schubert poses that problem. You better say, okay, you want to think about a world without innovation? Fine, it's a beautiful equilibrium, very stable, blah, blah, blah. 20 years later, von Neumann says, here's the way it works. Here's the full blow mathematical model of it, so you can actually understand how it works. And by the way, it says, everything has to be reproducible. That is essential. Because if everything that is reproducible, sorry, everything that is essential is not reproducible, then your growth stops. That's the actual message of von Neumann. And you want to have it balanced, better be balanced because everything reproduces at the same rate. Okay? If once you start violating that, you go off balance group. Alright? And Schubert says, in fact, he says that's what we do. What innovation does is whenever one of the factors becomes scarce, sort of purely because people can see new opportunities that they didn't see before, they change the composition of factors of production that change the set of available activities. You know, von Neumann is written, if you have taken a quick look, as a bunch of activities. As activities representing inputs, activities representing output. Okay? And what Schubert is saying is, look, we perturb that by adding a bunch of activities. That's what innovation does. Once you change the bunch of activities, the balance growth changes. And the economy swings away from where it was going and starts going to the new balanced growth. But to the extent the process of adding activities is frequent enough, you actually never go to the balanced growth. You swing around. Right? And how fast you swing around, that will depend on how frequently you add activities. You know, it's, there's no rule, which I think tentative of finding rules in technological change I find it idiotic. I mean, any look at history of technology, you know, shows that there's, there's no really much of a regularity. The only regularity might be that 
there are general physical or, or scientific principles that are more important than other, and then one of, one of them is discovered and turned into something useful for production, it has a long set of consequences. So the typical example when people realized the molecular structure of matters and started to play with compounds and we have got modern chemistry to come around, right? Then the chemical industry, you know, grew and there was a, a cascade of innovations there all related to the fact that people say, oh, you know, there are molecules out there, I can play with them, I can make new materials. And when the electrical engine came around, people said, well, the electrical engine, I can put it anywhere. It's a lot, lot less polluting, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and so a lot of changes, and probably PC and artificial, uh, in the PC personal computer, you know, artificial intelligence, computational ability, uh, you know, uh, guiding uh, movements by artificial intelligence is probably part of that. But other than that, None of us could have predicted in 1970 or 1980 that uh, out of the PC and the, and, the, and, the, and the chips we would have got uh, you know self-driving cars. I don't think it was obvious at all. You know, you, sure, the so-called futurologists have imagined everything. Problem is that they always imagine everything. They they all belong to the famous Summerson uh, dictum. You know the story. Right? Yeah, Summerson was incredibly good at jokes very nasty ones in particular. Not necessarily, but this was. So he was poking fun at somebody, one of these uh, people that always made forecasts about TV, and he said, oh, absolutely, Dr. XYZ is absolutely good as a forecaster. Matter of fact, he has been able to forecast 17 of the last five recessions. Well, you know, if you forecast a disaster every year, you're going to forecast them all. You know, in fact, the guy had forecasted 17 of the last five. Uh, <laughs> And the same is true for futurologists, you know, Leonardo had forecasted everything, right? He had flying machine, he had submarines, he had... But if you let imagination go, it's fine, utopia is always... But, but instead of trying to find actual laws that stand the test of statistics, I don't think that's the task. What is the task is to focus, and that's what we're going to do next, on this big transition. I think it's the big transition. They start thinking, you know, that yes, indeed, that production function first may not cross the 45 degree line, may go on forever. If it goes on forever, it's because the reproducible factors are good substitute for non-reproducible one, and because of the fact that eventually, for given technology, all factors become essential, and they all have to reproduce at the same speed, and this is not empirically possible, apparently, it's just a fact, okay? Then the technological change has to be that particular process that replaces factors that grow slowly, factors that uh, are very expensive, factors that are scarce with other factors that can be reproduced and are not scarce. And that's, you know, the role of innovation that, you know, Schumpeter insisting that that's what we should look at and that's what's producing most of the dynamics of modern economies, in some sense it also produced most of the dynamics even in the very long run, only people could see it much less. I right? think of the impact of the wheel of the chariots uh, in the old days, or the impact of uh, uh, um, the bow arrow that the Mongolian uh, uh, tribes could handle that was more powerful than the one the Europeans and the Chinese had. You know. So that was the technological advantage that uh, the, the golden old had. They could stand on a horse, on a wooden saddle, they kept them very stable, they didn't have a stirrups, and they had uh, bows that could shoot at 40, 50 meters more than anybody else. That allowed them to decimate anybody, right? <laughs> that was a major change, right? <laughs> right? They, they ended up conquering pretty much you know, most of the world that mattered at the time. And so that was... So technological change does have a big impact on the dynamics of the world even before, what obviously is particular in the last 200 years that we see it happening very quickly. You know, before it happened over decades, now it happens to, over a few weeks, or a few months, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the big thing. So that's, uh, <clears throat> that's the point, uh, uh, the point for, uh, for, uh, for today. Uh, for today's talk here, let's see, we have a few minutes, so if you want to ask, uh, 
I talked a lot of stuff. So. Because we yeah. uh, didn't get to work. When uh, you draw the little plant growing, okay? So that was in the view of a technology change? No, no, it okay. was a way of suggesting technology change, that it, there has to be technology change, but the, the graph was the graph of this, right? So if I use a blackboard to draw a CS production function through ISO ones, right? What is that I have? Capital here, labor here, okay? I have a bunch of ISO ones, right? That's what I have. That's my representation of a production function. As I move from one to another, I increase output, right? This is level one, this is level two, this is level three, right? So this is increasing output, right? What is that the process of production does? The process of production accumulation. Constant technology, right? Absolutely constant technology. I start from somewhere of a certain endowment of capital and labor. I employ them, right? And I